culture. We operate this illustrious museum as well as a capital grant program, the African American Heritage Preservation Grant Program of $5 million a year. I want to first recognize our incredible chair, the Reverend Dr. Tamara E. Wilson. Douglas Museum Foundation, who without them, we would not be able to do the amazing programming that we do. Uh, our chair, Ms. Beryl Hall, <laughs> and to the staff of the Banneker Douglas Museum. We have a small but mighty staff here, and they do an incredible job making sure that our programs are done with excellence and authenticity. Our curator extraordinaire, Ms. Shalesa Howard. <laughs> I added the extraordinaire part. She doesn't have that on her business card, but <laughs> she did. Uh, and our marketing director, which is how you all probably got here today, Ms. Jan Lee. I'd also want to recognize our uh, administrative manager who should write a book on hospitality services, <laughs> Mr. Leron Herbert, <laughs> and our beloved security guard slash local historian slash all things <laughs> excellent, Mr. Ted Hyman, who many of you met downstairs. <laughs> and I would be remiss if I did not recognize and thank the hard work of the Vice Chair of the Maryland Commission on African American History and Culture. You'll see the shirt, Morgan State University <laughs> Professor, Dr. <laughs> and I will say this, uh, this exhibition, The Radical Voice of Blackness, has meant so much to this institution, engaging people of all backgrounds, of all ages, uh, to explore the history of black resistance, black joy, and methods of healing. So I would, I'm gonna give a heartfelt thank you to the artist, Devin Allen, Blackness speaks to resistance and joy, 
explores America's fraught history of systemic racism while celebrating the resiliency of a people who have preserved, persevered, despite social and political devices to suppress them. Here, the joyous moments of black life and quotidian experiences that honor the black family are celebrated through expressions of healing, leisure, and joy. Artists pay homage to the grit and determination of a people to maintain their civility despite systems of oppression, and in so doing, declare autonomy over blackness, reclaiming it from negative connotations and, in its place, affirming its morality, dignity, and pride. The exhibition honors Maryland icons such as abolitionists and social reformer. I'm sorry, I'm just going to go next to it. Um, Frederick Douglass, and acknowledges the contributions of social reformer Dr. Lily May Carroll Jackson, organizer of the Baltimore branch of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the NAACP. So, as our conversation begins, I'll introduce Devin Allen. He is a Baltimore-based, born and bred photographer who gained national recognition for his documentation of the protests and unrest that occurred in the aftermath of the death of Freddie Gray in police custody in Baltimore in 2015. Allen's photos, which were featured on the cover of Time magazine, captured the raw emotion and the human stories behind the protests and helped to bring attention to the issues of police brutality and systemic racism that were at the heart of the protests. Since then, Allen has continued to document the lives and stories of people in Baltimore and beyond, using his camera to shield, shed light on the struggles and triumphs of communities that are often overlooked and marginalized. In this exhibition, his works speak to the resistance and joy. The photographs reveal acts of joy and resistance woven into the everyday life of African Americans. In quoting from the artist's statement he wrote on these works, it's a part of our DNA, finding joy even in the darkest moments. We live fight and love from our streets, street corners to the front line. Born into, into a society that has been built to crush us, we find ways to not only exist, but navigate and survive. Devin, yeah, those are really powerful words. Um, in your recent book, which is No Justice, No Peace, a plug, <laughs> you explore the history and culture of Baltimore and the ways in which the city has been shaped by inequality and resilience. In your introduction, you share how your family's love, the gift of a cabinet from your grandmother, and Baltimore has shaped you and how photography transformed your life. Tell us what inspired you to become a photographer. Um, I kind of stumbled into it. It was, uh, you know, I always tell people, uh, you know, art was something that wasn't really offered to us in my community. You know, maybe had like one art class. You know, it's like draw a square, you draw these lines, now you got a key. You know, A plus. You know, um, and it's interesting because when I meet a lot of my peers that are photographers, they, uh, you know, in white school they had like dark rooms and all these things. They didn't have those. And I had a friend, you know, he was the star athlete, you know, straight A student. I was the kid that didn't apply stuff. Could have been a straight A <laughs> student, but I was a knucklehead. But he went to the army and, you know, we took different routes and we came back together as young adults and I was a party promoter. And while he was in Iraq, he fell in love with party. And he was like, you're a party promoter. I want to do a poetry night. Let's do it. And I don't know anything about poetry. He was like, trust me, women love poetry. It's all you need to know. <laughs> and we started a poetry night. and. Actually, around the same time, you know, poetry, I wasn't good at it, I sucked, it was horrible. But I started gravitating towards photography because he inspired me, introduced me to, um, to art. And 
Well, I started Googling famous black photographers and the first person that popped up was Gordon Fox. And I just seen him with his pipe, hair slicked back, <laughs> oh, this guy's cool. And then I seen his work on Muhammad Ali and gangs in Harlem. I said, I want to see this guy. And you know, I remember marching into my grandmother's house and she was like, you want something, you don't just come see me for no reason. And I said, I want to be a photographer. And that was in 2013. And she helped me get my first camera. And, and around that same time, I had transformed it. Where I used to hang on the corner all day, I found myself exploring Baltimore behind the lens. And it kind of put a, a kind of like a wedge between me and my, some of my childhood friends because of the transition of finding something that I was passionate about. They didn't, they didn't understand. And uh, sadly enough, after a month of having my camera, one of my friends was murdered. Mm -hmm. And I went to go pay respects to his mom. And then when I left, we murdered my other friend. And if it wasn't, if I wasn't adamant about going out and taking pictures that day, I would have been with my friend and I probably wouldn't be here today. Mm -hmm. And that's when I sat out and said that I was going to do this for the rest of my life. And I kind of found my voice in it. I lost a friend to police brutality, Sean Gash, who was mur murdered in Baltimore City in 2011. I didn't see the power in going to a protest. But when Mike Brown passed and then Freddie Gray, it was different. You know, I, the camera gave me a voice and I wanted to use my art to tell that story. And that's, you know, what I've been adamant about my entire career since then. Many of your photos in the book capture moments of joy and celebration, as well as moments of pain and struggle. How do you approach capturing such a range of emotion? And what do you hope viewers take away from seeing these images? Yeah, when I, when I first started documenting, I didn't know what I was, you know, I just in the Gordon Parks is my whole compass with everything. You know, he used the camera as a weapon, and that's what I, I wanted to use it for. But as I documented, you know, I'm a part of the community. This is my home, but I became kind of like an outsider from outside the snow globe looking in. And I started understanding the power that I had, that I'm speaking for people, and I'm, I'm dictating how people see my community. You know, I'm controlling the narrative. and. I wanted to make sure that any story that I tell is just honest. And a lot of times with media, I, you know, to quote one of my best friends, Dee Watkins, you know, we want to speak for ourselves, but we don't have those platforms. We are in Baltimore, in so many places like Baltimore, media always tell us what we are. You know, anywhere I go, the first thing they say, Baltimore like the wire. <laughs> That's all they know, but it's so much more than that. You know, they don't know about the sitting on the stoop and the love and the, the, the passion, you know, the community, you know, the pride that we, you can see the hat, I'm from West Baltimore, it's a pride that comes with that, knowing that I'm, my grandmother came up, you know, from North Carolina as a teenager, my family, been in West Baltimore ever since I'm third generation, I take pride in that, so I wanted to show that through the imagery, so I wanted to show strength, resilience, love, compassion, and shed light on these things that are that aren't a part of the conversation. You know, media, if it bleeds, it, it leads, and that's, and that's what gets the break. You know, a lot of times they want to show us showing love and, you know, embracing each other. And, and in my community, the reason why I am here is because Freddie Gray died. Hmm. I became successful, but that, that, that vehicle that was given to me was put in this position by my community because they trusted me and allowed me to tell that story. And that's from love and growing up with these people in Baltimore. And I want to make sure that the imagery speaks to that. It's all right. national attention and helped to spark a national conversation about police brutality and systemic racism. And we're looking at the image of the Citadel. Can you talk to us about what that experience is like for you and how it has influenced your work? It was I didn't know, you know, I got my first camera in 2013, and here I am. 2015, you know, I'm, me and Freddie Gray share a mutual friend, that's how small Baltimore is. 
You know, I can easily be Freddie Gray, and I probably know why to tell this story better than me, but I did not know what I was walking into. Um, it, it actually broke me, you know, and it's something that I speak out often, definitely post. You think about George Floyd, when the whole country was, was on fire, I already had been through it, but I felt alone going through it. Um, you no, know, other places didn't understand, you know, and I think the closest people that understood were activists and people on the ground in Ferguson at that time. You know, I was suicidal, I was depressed, um, I wasn't eating right, I wasn't sleeping right. You know, you have these moments where it's kind of like a call to action and everyone wants you there. You know, and it's like, you know, you have to find balance in between that. It's something that I learned over time. But I think the, the, the darkest moment for me, you know, was taking these images and it's like this gentle, like, um, you can feel the change in the air, but it's like, it's not there. So it's like you kind of like suffocate underneath of it. And, and I think it was that Saturday when I took the time cover. Um, you know, it, it was kids that started the uprising. A lot of people don't understand that. It wasn't a doubt for these kids in high school that were clashing with police that started everything. And I didn't realize the weight of the work and, until, you know, you had the success of it. And it's, it's you interviews and then you're right back on the front line and then you get tear gas and then you know, you're worrying your mother, your mother calling you and you're watching your friends get snatched up on Pennsylvania Avenue. It, it was a lot. You know, and I think the moment that, that changed me the most is the fact that in the process of that, my mother had to call the police on me because I was suicidal. Mm -hmm. And it got to the point where I just broke, you know, uh, and, and you know, a lot of, when I first thought, I hit it for a while and now I speak of it probably because I, I know my story and I've seen what it can do to you. So I shared this openly because I was a talk on the ground. When they went through it in 2020, you know, they, 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 they leaned on me. You know, it was like, this is what got me through. You know, but to have my mom call the police and the police come get me because I am so excited at this point. And the police officers know, know who I am. So they put me in like the, the patty, I'm not the patty one, but the back of the police car and, you know, take me to the hospital, you know, and they tell me how much I got to live for, which is ironic, mm. you know, because uh, they know the work. And, you know, it was kind of like a wake up call. You know, and it's one of the moments I had to break because it made me stronger. Mm -hmm. And I was able to come back better tenfold. You know, I was able to come back and, you know, start to activate the next generation. And, and, and at this protest, this is one of the things that kind of inspired me seeing kids on the front line with these things that I witnessed watching movies and learning about from school. And my mother would tell me about, my grandma would tell me about, now I'm living. But I was, I was able to intervene and control the narrative and help shape it. And I wondered, what if there's more Devon Islands right here at this moment? Mm -hmm. You know, and, I, and this actually was, this image was actually taken at a uh, Kiev protest at City Hall, not just for Freddie Gray, but also about education and mm -hmm. underfunding in the, in the community. Then I was like, all right, so what? I photograph and that's not enough for me. What does my activism actually look like? You know, because everyone's not labeling me acting is like, no, I'm just a concerned citizen <laughs> at this point. And I just started teaching. You know, I started giving out cameras and started teaching kids and start, you know, allowing them to speak for themselves and activate their voices and, and teaching them the power behind the camera, you know, and teaching them about voice and sharing those stories so therefore they can tell their own stories. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So let's talk about, thank you. Let's talk about the joy in your work. The who? The joy. 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 And the image, Beautiful Ghetto, from the Beautiful Ghetto series, where you have uh, this full montage of black people on the stoop, children playing, and superimposed is a woman who's really at the forefront, and in my view, she's on the, the right, probably the left. She's on the right there. Tell, tell us about this image as it relates to life in West Baltimore, your experiences as a Baltimorean, and, and you know, having it as a testament to our everyday lives and the joy that we share and the love that we share in our community. Yeah, um, so what I started to do with my work is, um, you know, I didn't 
didn't have, you know, I'm lucky enough now that I've met other artists and I've been able to move and travel, but, you know, photography has its limitations for me, um, where it allows me to digest the world and I regurgitate it to everybody else. So what, during, you know, um, like during COVID, I had time to like sit, you know, I started painting and started writing again and started just, you know, expanding on my art because I've been living in the uprising state of mind where I've been creating the same body of work, you know, because it was needed, but I had COVID gave me time to take a step. It kind of didn't because I still, George Floyd happened and Tony McDade and Gunnar Tell and I found myself five years later back on the front lines, you know, um, had another time cover. Um, but what I learned with resistance and joy is just the everyday life, you know, that, that, you know, I find that smallest things, you know, that we do is a form of activism and resistance. You know, if you think about, I think about like the grandma who sell the, the icy cups on the corner, you know, or I remember my home, my homeboy grandma used to sell loose ones and cigarettes and, you know, it's like these little things that add to the experience of the community that we overlook that's part of everyday life that's actually showing resistance and finding ways around a system, you know, that um, that we have, you know, that we always are evolving around and changing. And I really wanted, when I started to do the, the collage work, I wanted to show just the layers of, you know, of people just living. And a lot of times that's overlooked, you know, um, and as in, in photography, I wanted to like shed light and, and create imagery that people can self reflect on. You know, you'll be surprised in this day and age how many people don't have images of themselves. If they do have an image of themselves, it's on a phone. You know, like it's not like back in the day, like I'm in the process of fixing up my childhood house and I'm like going through, you know, years and years of imagery that my grandmother was capturing. And I was like, oh, snap, she's the first child that I actually knew. You know, but it was like pictures at the cookout. And, and these are the moments that I think are very, very important. And, and a lot of this work is inspired by Eric Thompson too. He had an amazing film that was given to me by Aaron Bryant called um, Three Eight Lens Darkly. That's, that, that talks about the, the, the black family and, all, and our history living inside of our homes. That we are not a part of the greater American story, but we are in our homes. So I just wanted, I started to create imagery and collage work and, and paint, not only about my experience, but just things that I walk past every day that, that, that inspired me. You know, um, and that's kind of what the image is. You know, um, you can see, you can see in the corner, it's, it's, it's two guys walking with twin boys on their shoulders, and then you can see the kids swinging from the balls, and other two kids looking at them. But then two guys, two older guys sitting on the stoop showing, you know, just multiple generations. And you can see the mom in the corner store putting something in our pocket. And you can see the kids with the boxing gloves, you know, because they were standing at the corner store on Pennsylvania Avenue. And it was like, we live these people, we live these complex, like, simplistic lives in the hood, but it's so beautiful because despite everything under, you know, the oppression, there's still joy there, and we still are functional. And I just wanted to show that. Thank you for capturing these beautiful moments of our humanity. So Wesley, turning to you now. <laughs> Wesley Clark was born in Washington, D.C. and raised in Silver Spring, Maryland. He is an artist who works primarily in sculpture, installation, and mixed media. He is known for his conceptual art, approach to art, often exploring themes related to identity, social justice, and history. The works in this exhibition uh, address reparations, inequality, healing, and self-preservation providing important insights into some of the most pressing issues of our time. Wes, your work often explores things related to racial socialization and self-empowerment. Can you speak to why these topics are important to you? Um, <clears throat> so, something why, um, why these topics are important to me, I think, well, one, now I'm a father and thinking about, you know, the future um, and just, you know, the world we're leaving behind, the legacy. I think about how I was raised, how my father raised me, how my mother raised me. And wanting to do something, um, wanting to speak to something that is going to help improve life. Um, and so, <clears throat> I guess I'm a 
quiet person in general, you know, when out in public, and yet this is how I speak to, you know, anything that I care about is through art. And so you want to make, you know, a statement. You want to speak to something of power. So, you know, these are things that I think about constantly in my head, just, you know, on, on, on various scales. And so it really becomes a, a, a thing for me. It's like, well, what's an interesting way to bring this conversation out to the public? And I mean, in a way that they'll think about it, that may stick with them. Um, and so yeah, that's, that's constantly just my main thing. It's just like, how do I get people to think about some of these issues from a completely different perspective, a completely different way? Um, you know, hence using the crossword puzzle as a vehicle to, to bring about some of the, you know, some of the conversations. Um, it's something that you, that, you know, I didn't grow up doing crossword puzzles and I'm still not good at them now. Uh, I, was, I believe I saw my father doing them at a page. Mr. Ken Clark, shout out to him. Yeah. So I keep pointing to this guy here. That's why. Um, the, and so, you know, I, I, I see people do them and I, and I always wanted to be good at them, but here was a way for me to, you know, create my own. And, and, and I, I realized, for instance, like, it was a, a way of, putting words, because oftentimes, you know, I'm, I write lists of, you know, just a uh, stream of consciousness, right? One word begets another, begets another, begets another. And you're able to, in, in those, each word makes me think of various ideas. And so like, well, how do you put all these ideas into a painting, right? And so I realized it's like, well, I just use the words themselves in this format. And, you know, it all kind of actually worked out and it's been successful thus far. <laughs> so, um, but again, it's, it's, it's really just about, you know, putting the words together and, and, and seeing how they make you think about things. In this case, it's companies, right? Um, sorry, am I jumping ahead? Yeah. Okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So for this exhibition, your works fall into two categories, resistance and joy. Yes. So we're going to talk about the two puzzles that you created, which were actually, uh, uh, from a concept that you had a few years ago and part of an exhibition titled Reparations. Some things are just owed and some more than others. And so we have Profiteers 1 and 2, which are puzzles that investigate the economics of slavery and the commodification of black bodies through what appears to be simple crossword puzzles. However, under closer observation, viewers realize they are being confronted with a painful truth. In Profiteers 1, enslavement reveals the names of corporations that profited from the transatlantic slave trade, and many of which continue to operate today, namely Lehman Brothers and J.P. Morgan. Um, so do you want to talk about it from a historic pro prospect? I'm sorry, and then we can go into profiteers too and talk about the uh, investors. Sure. So, I believe the idea initially came um, for this project or for this piece around I was, uh, which kind of became hand in hand. I was listening to um, Michelle Alexander's The New Jim Crow on audiobook because I'm constantly audiobooking. Um, and it made me wonder, you know, she was speaking about mass incarceration, I believe, it, and she may have touched on, on, on this fact as well, I can't remember specifically, but it made me wonder just how many companies are still around that were, you know, that profited from slavery. I just, I never thought about it, and I was surprised, you know, to see, like, oh, <laughs> there's plenty, you know, and I think it was also realizing, like, around that time, I think of like Georgetown University had um, acknowledged that they had owned slaves and that they had sold. And, um, and so it's really just that, 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 that simple question and investigation. It was like, you know, how many? And, you know, these in, that are still in existence and still operating. And there are more but than, than what I listed here. But it's, it's even then you kind of have to, work, you have to decide, you know, because companies, you know, they're separate entities, so to speak, and they get bought out by this one, and this one gets bought by that one, and so on and so on. But it's like, so these, for the most part, were had a pretty solid lineage, you know, um, straight through, um, to from then to now, and that was kind of 
why I specifically focused on these companies. And then in profiteers too, imprisonment, companies benefiting from today's modern form of slavery, the prison industrial complex, are eerily connected as their names overlap on the puzzle board. Among them, Walmart, General Motors, Verizon, and Chrysler. So can you explain how they profit from power? So, it's, all, it's also funny, um, because as I'm looking at it, you, you, you realize like just how interconnected all of this is, right? Um, you know, when the fact that you can make a crossword puzzle out of all these companies, it's much like a web in which the, our economics work. Um, so for instance, I'm trying to think of, uh, to begin with, who is it as an example. So Bank of America, if I recall, was, they are, like when prisoners come out, they have um, essentially cards, like right? debit cards, just like everyone else, but yet they're charged at a higher rate than we are, uh, as far as just to be able to pull money out, even at a teller, like at a, you know, going straight to the teller, they're charged. Um, they're also, uh, I believe that's also what the commissary money was used, was, was, was also managed through them as well. Um, who was another one? That was a good one. I mean, it's, it's so Pepsi, for instance, I didn't think I didn't think I cared about you know, Pepsi being on the list per se because I don't drink Pepsi. But I didn't realize Pepsi owned all the little snack companies that my kids <laughs> are, 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 are eating. And you know, whether it's like the you know, these little crackers with the peanut butter on them and you know, that's Pepsi. And I was like, hey, they got me, you know. <laughs> and I was I was looking at the list and for us, I just switched to a two-year contract, you know. Like I literally just switched, but I think it was Comcast, I think it's on the list too. And so you realize like, you know, how do you get away from these folks, right? Um, or that becomes the question. And I mean, so that you know, it, as far as when it comes to mass incarceration, I mean, like they're, they're getting on some on both ends. And so they're, they're scooping us up and bringing us in and to feed the machine, and yet then we're also paying, you know, they're giving up our dollars on the, on the, on the back end, right? So the, the, the reason for my even thinking about all of this really was from an economic standpoint of like, well, what do we do? What can we do, right? And I was looking at each of these companies as being in an industry that we could start a business in, right? We always wonder like, oh, you know, what should I do? For those that wonder, you know, what, what should I do? What can I do? And that want to start a business. And, and you were saying just like, you know, this is the everyday resistance, right? To some degree, it's my not buying those little crackers for, for, you know, my kids now, now that I know. Um, switching banks, you know, um, supporting more of the black banks that are, that are there, what have you. So, you know, it's, it is insidious. Because you like you know the, the list that, that that is there. I mean, they, you know your toilet paper is probably coming from there. You know every little thing can be connected, and so it is a, 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 something to just consider if, if if you don't want to participate in the mass incarceration system. You know to you know what you can do to, to, to make that switch. And so it's really just about that that bring, bringing this to light is really all I was trying to do. Thank you. Um, I think you may have answered this in part, but I'll just read the question. And so I'm rambling. No, but I love it. It's all interwoven. I love it. Um, so you stated the intention behind the puzzles is to use them as a tool to help the black community think about self-respect and to encourage the building and supporting of a black economy. You've chosen to name these companies so we as consumers might seek better options. Um, so tell me, what, what do you think about the relationship between art and activism and how you see your art contributing to efforts to address inequality and injustice? So I think, you know, for this is an example of a piece where, you know, it's about disseminating the information um, and getting it out there and people seeing it. And, you know, I've had several responses to it just like, you know, just amazed, you know, I was amazed. And so I think, you know, art and activism can go together in, in, in that it's just a matter of presenting it. You know, sometimes it's whether, I mean, because we see these things every day, or, you know, many of us do. Some people will never see them. I've had, you know, uh, a cat come to me while at one of my shows disturbed 
because he had never, he said, he had never considered his race before until looking at one of his pieces, a young, young white cat. And, you know, he was truly bothered. And <laughs> at the time, I was kind of chuckling to myself. It was like, yeah, I think about this every day, homie. <laughs> what you been doing? You know? and, but that, you know, but that's activism, right? Like, that's, that's what I'm doing, and that's the point of it. And that particular piece that he was looking at would dealt with reparations as well in the sense that it was, um, it, was a, it was another crossword puzzle where you could write in, you could fill in the answer, but every answer was reparations. And every clue on the little side thing that I built that had the clues carved in it um, was, you know, obviously the answer was reparations, but it was listing all the various forms of reparations that America has given to various folks or in different forms and this and that, and then on one side, I think so that was like a cross and then down was like all the various definitions of it. And so it's kind of like once you answer it one time and you write it and you answer it a second time, write it, and after a while you can't deny it, you know, and that's the whole point. And so that, you know, that's what art does. Like it, it, it can just kind of seep into you and stick with you in a different format than, you know, the news, you know, may, you know or it might connect dots to you that you didn't realize, you know, like you're aware of this, you're aware of that. We didn't really see how it all connected, and so you know that's that's what that's what we do. So let's move on and talk about the gift, which represents joy. So the, the gift offers concepts around healing work, whether from the present day or generational trauma, as a means of communal uh, preparation and advancement. From your artist statement, you said. As a husband, father, and son, I offer the gift to black men and their progenies seeking emotional healing. Um, in creating the work, you drew from Christian iconography to depict a loving encounter between a father and son. The subjects are formed in resin that appears as stained glass, rendered in the shape of a church window, symbolic of a religious temple, surrounded by lush foliage with soul at, so, soil, I'm sorry, at their feet. So one of the questions you pose in, to the viewer is in that they must determine if the heart in the father's hand is being gifted to the son or received from him. Your piece, you present this piece to convey messages of love and self-respect. So tell us, how, does your pers how, how do you personally identify with that piece? and the experiences of black men, um, and then how does it influence the themes and messages in the gift? So <clears throat> the gift is definitely a very personal um, piece in terms of just thinking about myself as a father, um, and, and, and really just even my own life. Um, at a certain point, I realized that I have, I walk in the world with this armor on me, right? And I used to say, like, at some points, like, it felt like my, I was melting or my heart was melting at certain points because I was responding and reacting to things, whether it was, like, you know, seeing a certain scene and, you know, and it makes me tear up and it's like, man, like, I, would, I, I never used to do that, you know? And, you know, you realize, like, you know, just over time what, what that is. And so, long story short, it, it I was thinking about how we raise our sons and how I'm raising my son and how I was raised. Now, the, I, that armor that I was talking about essentially is I buried my heart, right? So that when I'm out in the world, you know, dealing with certain things, it's not, you know, it's not hitting me and, and, and touching me in the same way. However, the, on the flip side of that is you realize you're not opening yourself up to I mean, just the joy of you know, various emotions in life and what have you. And so it was really about, you know, being a fuller human being, this idea of unburying one's heart and so that I can give it to my son, so that I can give it to my daughter, my wife, and so that in return, we also can end up burying our own children's hearts in the, in the means of trying to protect them um, in terms of, you know, whether it's a toughening up or you know doing you know things of that nature that you know that we that either was done to us which 
I had to think about it because my father didn't do that to me and my mother didn't do it to me. So where did I get that from? You know, I had to question that also, just like, you know, where did that come? Where did this armor per se come from in the sense of how I was living and, and walking with the world? And also kind of realized as I was driving up here or riding up here that the music, I believe, had something to do with it because around that time everybody was thugging. You know, whether you were thugging, whether you actually were or not, you actually you kind of had to, you know, be prepared for someone else. <laughs> you know, whether they were thugging, you know, and that was, you know, the early, you know, early gangster rap days. So uh, boys in the hood and men in society had come out, and oh, everybody wanted to be open from from the movie. And so, you know, you realize now with distance how much that does play a role in that, right? Um, and at the time, I never wanted to play the music because I was enjoying it and listening to it. And I still enjoy and listen to it now, but I recognize, you know, <laughs> there's, there is a taint. And I think part of that taint is that armor that we, you know, we put on because then everyone is beginning to act and behave in a certain, in a certain way. Um, so anyway, it was really just, again, how we're raising our children and how we're allowing them to live a more fuller emotional life is really what I was trying to get at with that. And the unburying of my son's heart, my, my own heart, showing him my heart, give it, you know, giving him his heart. So you can read it in multiple, you know, multiple ways. But it is really just a, a celebration of of that, of, of being a fuller, more emotional human being. So the last question is, um, how do you in the past, you also shared that this piece was informed by Dr. Joy DeGruy, who writes about post-traumatic slave syndrome, in which she encourages us to internalize the discussion of reparations to include what we as Black Americans owe ourselves. Explain to us what Dr. DeGruy's theory means to you and how it informed uh, your work. Ooh, that's okay. <laughs> so, so Dr. DeGruy's work, I mean, it delves deep in various, many aspects of, of black life. And the, this piece in particular, um, you know, she speaks, there's a, a point in, in, in her, her book, um, and that's um, post-traumatic slave <laughs> syndrome is what her theory is. And, um, you know, when people compliment your kids, and said, oh, you know, he, he's, he's growing up to be such a young man. Oh, that little knucklehead ain't, you know, da, da, da. And, and there's an immediate kind of, you know, you kind of push, put him down a little bit. And, and, it's, and it's not out of, you know, not because you don't love him, you know, but it's, as she's putting it. But it it's, has been a form of protection from slavery when Master was looking at, you know, oh, she, she's looking mighty fine, you know. And you're like, no, no, this little ugly thing, you know, because you try to protect her from, you know, what his his, his eyes and, and what that can mean, right? And so those little things that have slowly kind of transferred and, and, and on up into society is kind of where, you know, that's just one instance of, of, of from you know that that I took from that book and, and where you you know begin to pull you know ideas like the gift from. Yes. I think so. <laughs> uh, so we want to thank you, Wes, and we're going to move on to Crystal now. Uh, Crystal was born in Arkansas. She's now a Maryland-based artist and educator, walking, working, I'm sorry, across painting, sculpture, video, and installation to explore how self-identified black feminine and masculine persons perform femininity and masculinity within popular culture. For this exhibition, Crystal's work examines resistance as a form of brotherhood, compellingly exploring where and how young black men will express joy, <coughs> grief, rage, camaraderie, and hope. The piece, Free Trade Five, is inspired by Slims, which takes its name from a Facebook post of a group of friends. Crystal, your work examines notion of black femininity and masculinity as a social construct. Can you speak to why these topics are important to you? I think a lot of my inquiry about 
gender comes from my experiences in the classroom. I've been an educator the last eight years, and a lot of the impetus for my work really began in the summer of 2016 when I had the experience to teach probably about a group of 10 boys, the ones who were always getting kicked out of class, the ones who were getting suspended constantly, were facing expulsion, or anyone, the ones who were being pushed out. And I remember talking to my principal and asking for permission to teach this book. The book was called Buck by M.K. Asante. And uh, my principal and other teachers advised me that they're not going to read a book. They don't do anything. And so to me, that made me think that you know, people assume that these boys had no spiritual interiority. You know, and um, like like you, Devin, I'm, I've been attracted to the the pe black people who I think express like a full range of humanity, and it made me think about um, like the very essence of humanity. And I think those boys. I've always, I've always been, they've always gravitated towards me. And I think they just, to me, show like the variability in humanity and the very essence of it. Like, and once I got relationship, developed relationships with them, I started to question, like who would, who would I be if I didn't have reliable income, if I didn't, if I was, wasn't, what I, if I was food insecure, or if I didn't have, if I didn't know where I would be sleeping that night, who would I be? And I just think like those boys and people like them are, you know, always judged based on like this behavior, but I've always thought that behavior was a form of communication. So I just became really curious and what are they trying to communicate? And I remember we read the book and they became really animated and I saw them reading. And I recorded videos and sent them out, and I was like, these boys are reading. And um, to your point, where you talk about this armor, I began to think about, or just ask questions about their behavior as a form of protection, and like this idea of hypervigilance as like a behavioral response for ch to protection. And that was, there was, I think it was about 10 years ago, there was a study done in Baltimore about with a group of, of young black men, and, and they were studying hypervigilance, and the ones who were proactively more aggressive were more safe, and they didn't get it quote unquote messed with. And so I just, I really want my work to be really a mirror back to the subjects I make the work about. And it's not necessarily less about me trying to like, speak on every half of community. I just want them to be able to walk into a space with a social space we deem of value to see themselves. Thank you. So let's examine your piece, Free Tray Five, um, which is exhibited here under the theme of resistance. And the images are of your former, a former student of yours, he and his friend serve as the subject in this piece, which offers an investigation into a bond they form that provides a sense of peace and being, despite the threat or experience of physical displacement in their everyday lives. So can you please share with us the backstory of these gentlemen? Thank you for giving me the opportunity. These two, I've, I've taught both of them. The one holding the flag, his name is Bobby, and I remember I talked to, I keep up with them every now and then. Bobby called me, like, I don't know, I think last year I spoke with him when I showed, I told him that I was doing this painting about him. And he was like, you know what, after you left, um, I feel like because I started my teaching career in Arkansas, but later got recruited. But after, I, he said, after you left, I got kicked out of school. And if you were still there, I probably would still be in school. Mm -hmm. So, oh, sorry. Um, I sometimes feel bad for leaving them. But, um, <laughs> um, to by his side is Mustafa, and he is Trey Five. 
uh, that's his, his, his moniker or whatever that he goes by, but he served a 12 year sentence. And these boys, they took this picture, not like really close by to school. And yes, they would, you know, at lunchtime, maybe walk off campus and come back. Um, but I think the larger story is like how they find a sense of belonging, you know, even under the threat of um, what they call, there's a term called hidden homelessness, whereas you're not necessarily out there on the street, you're just in different houses and, you know, just might be couch surfing. But they both were, they didn't have a home at the time. And Mustafa, Mustafa has like eight siblings, so he's always been very transient. And so they, yes, they are, I really debated about making this, this piece because of the flag, because it does honor that they are both in quote, I hate to use word gangs, but I just see them as like a group of boys that are aligned with certain principles. But really, I just think they were just finding a, a place to belong. Um, I debated about it because I wondered how would people perceive them, um, would people judge them, and then I just really became less concerned about that, more concerned with can they see themselves. So um, I write to Mustafa has a brother named Frangelo. I have a close relationship with him as well. And similar story, Frangelo is incarcerated right now back home because of petty stuff. And um, sorry, I'm really trying not to cry because it's, it's sad. It's really sad, and I think it just. I really try to, with students like these, I really try to really just be there. I think my role as a teacher, my, and my, my naiveness in the beginning was like, I'm gonna go in there and make a difference. I'm gonna change these kids' lives, but it's just not always like that. Like, to your point, like, Devin, the, being in those places where masses of people, black children in particular, are underserved, they're undereducated. Um, sometimes that life is gonna be what that is, and I just focus on my role as not as someone trying to change them per se, but just to be there with them. And I think I became an educator is like my guess my form of activism. And I think that you know social change begins with education. And I think it's often like begins with the, a person sh shifting their mind about things. So I began to teach them about things that they had never learned about. About to your point, Mich Jen, um, Michelle Alexander about incarceration, and then starting to realize that you know it was by design that they are where they are, and not some sense of like. Um, judgment on our own moral or some moral failure. And so I always tell people, I'm hoping that, like when you see boys like this, it just, I always just tell them to smile at them. Yeah. So I, that's, thank you. Um, you said that this puzzle is a way that honors their lightheartedness, playfulness, and gentleness, and to remind us of their humanity that the piece serves to validate their existence, identity, and respectability. And often, you know, um, it's, you deploy like this simple material in creating the puzzle, but the result is a manifestation of this profound statement to remind us of the vulnerability of these young men, the fragility uh, of their lives, and the circumstances um, of injustice and inequality and discrimination that you know, we in our communities deal with. This is why I'm so emotional about this as a mother of three men and a grandmother of six, five of which are black men. And when I look and think about what this world possesses, and that is the good and the resistance and the love and the amount of healing that needs to take place in our communities. I'm really strongly impacted by the imagery that you create. It resonates with 
something so deeply on a personal level because of my years as a black mother, as a grandmother, as a daughter, married to this extraordinary black man, and wondering when we can lower the armor and live our full lives and humanity without fear, without concern that the next encounter may be an innocent one or one that in which our lives might end. So um, I think that that is one of the reasons why your puzzle <coughs> moved me so much. And so that everything that's in this exhibition mirrors my life in some way or another. And that's why I am finding myself so emotional today because listening to you speak about it um, in ways that in many cases I haven't even thought about or with your work I'm revisiting uh, the conversations that we had around reparations and not only what that means in terms of what we hope this country will at some point do for us, but the responsibility that we have to ourselves and our communities and to our families, because no one's going to come and save us is the truth. And we are all in this situation and circumstances. And so, you know, I was, Devin, and thinking about your work and reading about Frederick Douglass, who in another life I thought I was going to marry, because I keep telling my husband, he's the only man that can take you away from your peer, your peer, your peer at some point. And he actually yeah, spoke in this very sanctuary um, in years ago. So thinking about that, and Frederick Douglass knowing the power of the image, right? And during his era, he was the most photographed American at that time. And he knew what that image, the power of his image meant, and how it could dispel stereotypes. And um, he wanted to depict and be captured in the greatest dignity and to display his dignity. And so I'm going back to your piece, while those young men may have been misjudged, um, you have taken upon yourself as an artist and a compassionate person to remind us that there is a heart there, there is a human being there, um, and whose lives have been impacted by so many things that were out of their control, but yet you've chosen to honor them. So I honor you. Together. <laughs> Do not worry about it. Let it out. This right. exhibition has been transformative. Where is she now? It's your fault. <laughs> so, let me move on before I completely lose it up here. Um, so, let's talk about, um, let's get in the weeds for a little bit here. And one of the subjects in your piece is holding a red bandana which you know, we touched on a little bit, but I want to um, delve into it a little bit more deeply. Uh, the gang symbol, because that has been a question by some of the visitors, if, and to ask if that is really symbolic of what, why it's there. And if so, you know, can you explain why we chose to include it? Because you could have easily have left it out. I think the, the bandana is definitely a focal point for sure. And I think when they took this picture, they're not thinking some artist is going to take this picture and render it and it's gonna be displayed in a museum. I think they were just really being themselves and displaying their, uh, their identities. And at that time, that's who, that's who they were. I mean, they were in this picture, I think they were 17 and 18. So they're still, they're still kids. And there were two pictures that I debated making, and there was, there was one without the flag. And then, me being myself, I always lean right on into controversy. <laughs> even in the classroom, because I think controversy is 
where change lives, or the most potential for, for change can live. And I, I wanted it to be a, a talking piece. And I chose the colors because I think it most represent who represents who I knew them to be. And I also wanted to honor their, their camaraderie in, in the red. I don't want to mention. We, we, we <laughs> like, I love them. <laughs> Again, I wanted them to say themselves, as, as soon as I sent them the finished piece, I mean, Bobby, the one that is holding the flag, Bobby smiled the hardest I've seen him smile in a very long time. So he felt very proud and he felt honored. And I've never known either of these boys to be violent. Um, of course, I'm not following them wherever they go, but generally they're, they're very gentle people. And I just remember in my coveted classroom space, where I really tried my best to make sure that they felt safe. I do remember, it, it, it's like they would enter my classroom and, and disarm a bit. You know, they would raise their hands, they would contribute to discussion, they would be making their peers laugh, and they would be asking very great, like, rich questions. And so I just, I really just wanted to do them a service and not censor them. So I, that's why I chose the flag because I didn't want to censor who they were at the time. I really wanted to honor them as, as they, as the church say, as they are. I love that. That um, I think that um, you created a safe place in your classroom for them to be themselves. And then in creating the puzzle, you maintain their truth. And I'm sure that that's why the, you know, the response and the joy, <laughs> the joyous response was there. Thank you, Crystal, so much. So I would like to ask if you all would like to join us by posing questions to the artist. I'm gonna have a few more, but you know, time is, is of the essence, so I'll give you a, a, an opportunity to pose questions, if you'd like. You Not a question, but a comment. A comment, yes. To all of you. Um, you've touched people's lives. They've had a break from your presence. They want to do something with their lives based on what you did with them as young boys. Please remember that. You've touched their lives. If you did nothing else except put your hand on their shoulder, you touch their lives. You touch a mind. All right? Thank you. Yes, would you like to, would you please stand? First of all, thank you. It's the community, you know. I'm lucky enough to have a strong family core that's there for me, you know. And I, I've learned when to take breaks, you know, <laughs> not to burn myself out. But I've seen the change from the work that I've done, you know. Um, I've given out, like, on, I stopped counting at 600 cameras, given out to, to the youth um, beyond Baltimore, Oakland, you know, Skeeto Museum of Harlem. Um, but I've seen the change in my community where, you know, um, it brings me joy, like when I get DMs from, from kids when they did a project on me. Or I uh, see, see kids walking down the street and, and they got a camera in their back pocket that I gave them years ago. I said, you still got that? Like, I ain't leaving this, not going nowhere. <laughs> you know, um, seeing my kids change, you know, um, and transform. You know, I had uh, one of my kids is at the Baltimore School of Arts right now. One of my kids, you know, um, he ended up getting something to NYU for a ride. You know, so the, the work that I'm doing, you know, uh, just activating the youth, I'm seeing the change. So anytime that I do feel like I'm, I'm, what I'm doing is not working, you know, I just think about the kids that I've been able to touch. And, you know, even the, the work that I do, and, and it's like a lot of my work end up on obituaries, you know, um, which, which is sad. But I think even in the joy of that is when the families come back to me and they request the work, you know, because, you know, um, they, 
probably some of those proud images they have of their loved one. You know, and that also um, makes me work even harder for the, for the community. You know, I, um, I think like last year I lost like two friends of fentanyl, and like three of my friends were, were murdered in Baltimore, one in downtown Baltimore. But you know, I always, you know, you got, still got that picture, or you still have this picture, and you know, um, sadly enough, you know, that's how the work is remembered. But you know, you see the smiles, and you see the what you might they might show on the news is the most negative picture they can find, but I might have a more beautiful picture, the most humbling picture, the most loving picture, you know, and that what continues to work. So in those moments when my morale is low, I turn to my community and then they always there, they always wrap their lungs around me. So um, the community keeps me pushing because I'm seeing the change in the next generation. Any other questions? <laughs> so, um, what advice would you give to other artists who are interested in exploring themes of systemic racism and inequality in your own work? <laughs> um, I, I, my biggest, like I, like I live in a real world, you know, and I know how it feels to not have a voice you know, um, not have a platform. And a lot of times I always thought like, this is life, this is just it is what it is. I can't change it, I'm born into it, I'm just going, you know, I'm just going to live. You know, I didn't plan my life past 21. And what I would tell any artist that wants to, you know, just just do it, just do the work, you know, um, do the research, you know, just put your good for, uh, foot forward. But I will say that the work is most impactful. If you hear all of us talking, we hear the passion in our voice. I always tell artists, they even ask me this question, I get this question often, is make sure the work that you're creating is from the heart. Because you can create the work anyone can create, but if your essence is not in it, your soul is not in it, and, it, and that emotion is not there, that care is not there, it can be very detrimental to, and actually takes a step backwards instead of forward. So I always tell people that, you know, create what, what, what works for you, you know, and, and, and look within, and you, that, that dictates what you create. Thank you. To your point, I would say, if you're interested in it, make sure you're doing the work. For, for me, um, a lot of my work comes about only after I spent a lot of time reading. And I think I often see people try to make their subjects fit their perspectives and their narrative, but I think that's doing the work backwards. And it's really the subjects who are driving the work for me. And because we live in a academia, like it does speak to the social and those points will be there. They're like to your point, Wes, that your kids eat products, Pepsi products, and <coughs> you made the connection from the real world to the academia. So it's just making sure that those two connect. Um, that, that's why I would say to focus on them too. And really just to focus on like who your subjects are and not trying to make them be something that they're not. Um, I would probably, again, go with what Devin was saying. Essentially, that start with yourself first in terms of what affects you, what you're thinking about, how do you feel about it, and then how do your friends feel about it? And then, you know, so you start with yourself and then that next circle, that next wider circle, and you see how it's affecting it and, and, and working with them. Um, I remember one of, the, one of the best critiques that stuck with me, uh, I was showing at a site conference um, year, years ago, and this one woman came through and, you know, was commenting on the work and said, you know, it's great, it's great. And she was like, you know, but, but where are you? in the work. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know she, you know, I had no clue what she meant. And, um, you know, she pointed at one picture and was like, you know, that protest, like, that, that was me. That was, you know, my generation. Where, you know, where are you? And I had never thought about that before, right? Um, and so now, I mean, this is 20 years ago, probably, you know, when she's talking, and, and I've clearly <laughs> kept with me, you know, kept it with me, and this is what I tell other people is make sure that you are pulling from yourself. Um, and because like you said, 
that passion, it will come through. And it's more authentic. And how you are putting it out. You know, I, I used to say I, you know, I was a painter. And now, and it took me a while to even say I was a sculptor. But it's really the idea drives the medium that I work in. And so being open to explore what will best, what vehicle best pushes your, your, your message forward. Um, you know, as you can see, I'm you know, working with resin and latex paint on you know wood panels for the, the crosswork. You know, so I'm bouncing around because I felt like those were the ones that carry you know the message best. Um, to you. I've always believed that the most compelling work is driven and informed by the artist's personal experiences. I think we have one last question. I'm going to add to that point of the personal experience from my day job. I was pouring myself out in the same way that you all do um, as, as artists just as people. So I was just like, you know, I was just like, you know, I'm looking to nourish yourself in that process. Um, so that you are not sort of draining um, yourself completely to be able to continue to offer this to the world. And then I guess the second question is, what can we do as the public to, to teach and nourish artists, either personally or in general, so that the creativity is, is supported, is sustained? You know, is it advocacy? Is it participating in, in events like this? Is it simply buying the um, art? I think what nourishes me is I like I need to, I always have to take a step back. And I even watching TV for me doesn't give me relief because I'm my brain I'm an educator, my brain is always critiquing and stuff. So I watch like old cartoons or I might read a book that has absolutely nothing to do with my subject matter, like whatsoever. Like right now I'm reading the matter of everything and it's about physics. And I have no desire to pursue that. <laughs> so, that is what, that's what nourishes me, spending time with, I have three sons, black men as well. Spending time with them, my wife, my family. And to your point, my artist work is always, always nourishes us. <laughs> it, it is, we are artists and we have to live and be in this world, and it's just affirming that someone really values and appreciates the work. And it's like, it just, it's, it's like affirmation of the passion that we put into it. So I smiled as soon as you said that. <laughs> that was my first thought. Was, I, I'm not working. <laughs> but uh, I too will take breaks, uh, you know, because, you know, for instance, you know, this work was shown in 19. Um, was when that reparation show, and it was, took me a good while, like to get out from under it in, in a way, because I mean, you know, you're, it's so easy to pile on, and then with your own studies of what you're doing, but then life is also happening, right? So you know, like I still to this day haven't seen, haven't watched the George, George Floyd video because of that, you know. Um, and so there's you know certain ways of protecting yourself that makes sense. Um, like so yeah, definitely taking the break. Oh, there was something else I was gonna say though. Who was it? Got it. <laughs> okay, then <laughs> come. <laughs> I'm gonna see the wiggle now. I'm gonna tag on that definitely by the art and the tech right on that. And for me, I don't do nothing. Like, like having nothing to do, like no urgency, you know, like I think as artists, it's like we worry about creating, creating, and I used to feel bad if I'm not creating, like I'm wasting time. Like, oh, I didn't take a picture today. Oh, I didn't do this today. I ain't, you know, I love like doing nothing. Like I would like binge watch something on Netflix, you know, go get on my mother nerves. Like I don't know, you know, <laughs> I have, I have uh, a 13 year old daughter who was like giving me a run for my money right now. Um, but you know, I find being, Moments of being still, you know, being around family, you know, even revisiting the old neighborhood, sitting with stupid with my childhood friends, and you know, because like to them, I'm the one that made it out. So anytime I show back up, it's a party, you know, um, and, and it's always love there. And uh, I think I think a lot of times also 
beyond even just buying the art, which is very, very important, because people just buy art just to buy it. You know, like people, oh, I want to buy your art. And then when I, when I send you a Zoom link, I want to talk to you, I want to know why you buy my work. <laughs> people get thrown off by that, because a lot of times when they meet artists, they work through, through galleries and all these different things, but my work is like, it's my heart. You know, you're taking a piece of me. Like, I want to know why you want this in your house, why you want this in your collection, because this is me. You know, um, people say, oh, you got a studio? You know, sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. I always say the streets is my studio. I'm always in the streets. You know, people see me walking around Baltimore, I walk from east to west, they're like, I'm not scared. Like, no. You know, I'm walking with, with abundance of love and joy through all neighborhoods, projects, everything. You know, the streets is, the pavement is my studio. And, and I think also just the, the, the sharing of the work is very, very, very important. Sharing, educating. Not only like, oh, this is an amazing photo, this is an amazing piece of art, but understanding our processes, understanding why we create, understanding our goals of the work is very important too. So also, just educating people about our work and the type of artists that we are and what we stand for. You know, because there's a lot of artists that might do similar work to us, but will all sets us apart for the fact that we're so invested in it and we do the work beyond the work. It's not just creating the work, but also that is just a vehicle to get our points across. And we do the work after the work is done and we're still doing it. And I think that's what sets a lot of artists apart. Some people create just to create, and other people create to make change and do the work afterwards and keep pushing. I remember what it was. <laughs> <laughs> so, I think this was just yesterday. I was on IG and Instagram and saw, you know, random post was like, you know, how to support, uh, you know, an artist. And it was the, the it was a simple thing. It was like, you know, just like and made the comment. And I was like, oh, that's you know, she's like, it's, it's affirming. It you know keeps us knowing that you know what we're doing is being seen, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I was like, oh, that's a cool thought. But then later that day, I got an email, just doing that, where someone was just 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 to say hi and that they like the work and this and that. And I thought about that same post that I just saw, you know, hours apart, and it was affirming, and it did feel good. So, you know, just from a simple, like, base level, you know, that was, that was excellent, you know, she, she, she basically sent a like via email, and then also she just commented on the work. Simple. That's the light stuff. <laughs> Thanks, Wes. Well, I want to thank you all. Uh, this is a very dynamic, uh, conversation. I thank you all for joining us today. So I want to ask you said one of my favorite words, and that's being still. I guess that's two words. <laughs> um, as we close out the program, I would like for Felicia G's uh, video to be played and would like to ask all of you to just be still for a moment <coughs> and listen to it. It's eight minutes and 46 seconds. That's the, length, that's the length of time that the police officer knelt uh, on um, George Floyd's neck. Uh, this video is about healing.
So, Ortiz, yes. while we're thinking about this being the George Washington uh, President's weekend, mm -hmm. think about the fact the first among the first resistors were his slaves. <coughs> uh, who got taken to uh, Philadelphia. And read the story of only judge, the slave who, uh, woman who escaped from there. Yes. Uh, and then uh, stayed away from, and she got into some of the Rhode Island sometimes. But she resisted, kept fighting uh, not to go back. Yeah. Uh, he also had a second slave yeah. to uh, his chef also disappeared out of Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. And of course, Washington took slaves there. Uh, uh, against the law of Philadelphia. Uh, they weren't supposed to bring slaves to Philadelphia. They were supposed to release them in eight months. Mm -hmm. uh, he kept rotating them back to Virginia. Right. I think if they stayed in Philadelphia <coughs> for six months, then they would be considered free. Right. And the chef's name was uh, Hercules. 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 Hercules.
this art exhibition that we massively curated, and they love it. So they'll be creating artwork that will be on display here in June. We we'll love it. And come on, show some support. Their first project is a photo project, and um, they are just so taken aback every time they come to the museum and learn about the artwork. So thank you all for coming here today, Commissioner Tony Spencer. We got members of the foundation. The community at large, thank you.